record. We were in the middle of John, uh, yeah, John chapter 17, Jesus, what's called a high priestly prayer. I think it's called a high priestly prayer because it, he is praying on behalf of his disciples. He starts out praying for himself, but he soon moves into his disciples, and then later then he moves into those who would believe through the testimony of those disciples. So that includes us. He's praying for us. Uh, now, if if we you know, had some great Christian leader, uh, you know, it used to be Billy Graham, but he's, he's, he's not around anymore. But if you knew that Billy Graham was praying for you, you would feel encouraged. But even better than that, we know that Jesus Christ is praying for us. So that's uh, even, uh, yeah, even better. Uh, it's just not uh, to be compared. Uh, when Jesus prays for us, we know that it will be. Let's uh, take a look at uh, the text in John. Um, there we go. We were had gone, gotten down to, uh, well, we completed verse 12. Uh, where John, uh, Jesus says, you know, none of his disciples had been lost except the one doomed to destruction. Uh, that's Judas. So that Satan, or yes, scripture would be fulfilled. <laughs> yeah. Satan had taken Judas. So verse 13, uh, Jesus is praying. Uh, sometimes earlier in the prayer, he kind of prays in the third person. He says, you know, he talks about the son. He talks about, you know, Jesus Christ whom you have sent. Here he's using first person, second person. Uh, I am coming to you now. So Jesus is saying, I, you know, I will soon be with you, Father. But I say these things while I am still in the world, so that they may have the full measure of my joy within within him, them. So his prayer is uh, spoken out loud to help his disciples have joy when they realize, when we realize what Jesus is doing in this prayer, uh, what he's doing with his whole life and ministry. Yeah, that gives us joy that we are uh, encouraged by uh, that Jesus, knowing full well the difficulty he was going into, went to his beating and his death for us and our salvation. Verse 14, he says, I have given them your word. So he's repeated what, what the Father has told him to say. And the world has hated them. Uh, and then the connection there is that the world hates the, God's word, uh, does not want God's instructions. So people who uh, accept God's words and follow God's words are rejected by the world. There's this uh, vying for allegiance going on. And when we deny the world that the world has uh, authority over us, then the, the world does not like that. They would like to have authority. Uh, and the world world hates the disciples because they are not of the world any more than I am of the world. We're not. That's not where we're from. That's not our identity. My prayer, he says, is not that you take them out of the world, even though that's they're not of the world. Uh, we'll we'll leave them in the world, but not of the world. So there's kind of a distinction there in the pronouns. Uh, well. You know, we are here physically, we are in the world, but we are not here in terms of our allegiance. Our, uh, uh, we're, we're marching to the beat of a different drummer. Uh, and that is, drummer is Jesus. Uh, to use a different metaphor. <laughs> uh, well, my prayer, and you don't take them out of the world, so we're not, we're not going into monasteries. Uh, but that you protect them from the evil one. So we are in the world, but we are protected from Satan's devices in some way. We're not always protected from uh, physical harm and persecution, just as Jesus wasn't. But 
Jesus wants us to be protected from Satan, that Satan would have no power over us, that the one who is in us, Jesus, is far greater in power than uh, than the evil one. So we uh, are on the right side, as it were. They are not of the world, even as I am not of it. So that's a repeat. He says, sanctify them uh, by the truth. The NIV footnote there suggests an alternative translation, which is kind of a an interpretation to what it means to sanctify. Uh, or, you know, sanctify them, them to sanctify them to live in accordance with the truth. This word by could also be used, and the Greek word by could be used in an instrumental sense, uh, the, the way in which something is accomplished. So that's the way the NIV translators are saying, well, maybe it, maybe it means that. There's, you know, perhaps good reason to think that, uh, that the truth will help set us apart for doing what God wants done. Any comments there? Your word is truth. That the word is, God's word is what uh, is true, and that is what sets us apart from the world, uh, makes this difference between us and the world. Any comments, questions there? Uh, Pastor Mike? Can, yes, for me. Can we also say, because somewhere uh, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. So we can also therefore say that we are also set apart or sanctified by the presence of the truth in us, who is Jesus. Um, because sometimes the living in accordance, um, that's something that's difficult to do on our own, right? Yeah, yeah, impossible. <laughs> yeah, there's this interesting, uh, you know, blurring of the the it's a blurring of the words word and truth. And if John chapter one, the word is uh, is a term that is used to as the, like equivalent for Jesus. Uh, so. Jesus is the word. Jesus is the truth. The word is truth. But he is also referring to the words that Jesus that and that Jesus speaks to, that God has Jesus speak. So there's kind of, they, they're all connected there. Uh, and uh, kind of they're, when one is there, the others are going to be there too. Uh, so yeah, we we are indeed sanctified uh, by Jesus being in us, uh, and by His words also being in us. And that is like those we we can't separate the two. We can't have one without the other. Uh, and the different, the, you know, the the uh, overlapping of meanings that uh, makes it. Uh, hard to distinguish between those two. Does that uh, yeah, answer your question? <laughs> yeah, all right. Verse 18, Jesus says, as you sent me into the world, I have sent them into the world. So this word send is uh, like being an apostle. Jesus is called an apostle in the book of Hebrews. And he was sent. That's the uh, root words, meaning the root words for apostle. We've also been sent uh, just as he was. And for a mission. It's, it's not just that we are there, uh, but we have a mission to carry on, continue uh, the words and works of Jesus. Verse 19, Jesus says, for them, I sanctify myself. Now, what would that mean that Jesus sanctified himself? Wasn't he already sanctified? 
You know, he was holy from the very beginning. So there's, it's, the word sanctified doesn't always have exactly the uh, same meaning, I think. In, in this way, in, in this sentence, it could be that Jesus has sets himself apart for a specific function. And that's uh, part of the meaning of sanctified. That he's uh, dedicated to a specific role. And in this case, that the disciples may be truly sanctified, that we also are set apart for a particular role. And that's what he's mentioned in verse 18, I have sent them into the world. So all these, these clusters of terms inter, uh, overlap with each other, interact with each other. In the next section, Jesus starts praying for the next, the future generations of disciples. My prayer is not for them alone. I pray also for those who will believe in me through their message. And that is, uh, that, and actually that's the world that the disciples are at this moment in. They, some of the people who are currently part of the world will become part of the people who will believe in me through their message. So people move from one category to another. Jesus is praying for people to make that uh, transition from the out group to the in group. He, what does he want for them? He says in verse 21 that he, what he wants is that all of them may be one. Father, just as you are in me and I am in you. We have a oneness of uh, heart, mind, thought, words, deeds, uh, mission, purpose in life, that all of that is uh, connected and in agreement with what the Father is and wants. Says, may they also be in us, so that the world may believe that you have sent me. So there's a purpose to our unity, uh, not just unity with each other, but unity with Jesus and the Father. And the purpose of that is that the world may believe. You know, this people who are on the out group may become part of the in group. We they may believe that God did indeed send Jesus. Jesus was this uh, divine agent of God, and his words are God's words. Verse 22, I have given them the glory that you gave me. So he gives, Jesus gives us glory. It's in Roman, Romans 8, uh, Paul talks about you know, those he uh, you know, those he called. He also you know uh, I forget several yeah there, there are a couple of words in there, but then it also concludes them they he also glorified. And some people will take that to say, well, that's that's in the future. It's uh, as if it's so certain that uh, Paul can write it as if it's a was a past event a fact. But here Jesus is also using glorified. In term as a past a past event, I have given them the glory you gave me. So there's more to the glory than, well, yes, we will be more glorified in the future than we are now. But we already have, we already share in some of Jesus' glory in terms, uh, and that is in terms of the way we respond to his message. That Jesus sanctifies us and gives us glory, uh, honor, uh, that we are um, designated, separated for a, as a specific group of people who are uh, part of his people, and that there's a glory to being some of Jesus' people. And Pastor Mike, oh, yes, I'm sorry. Yes, sure. Yeah, go. Yeah, go ahead. Okay, on that glory subject, um, I 
think of that verse that we've all fallen short of God's glory. Do you think this has anything to do with that? Well, yeah, it's kind of like, well, the past tense, yeah, we have fallen short. Uh, and I'm not sure whether it, it's saying, all right, there are, is, is it talking about different kinds of glory there? Or that we, uh, yeah, we are not yet all of what we should be. We have fallen short, and yet God does uh, say that we are of value. We are of worth to him. Uh, so we were unworthy, but yet he declares us of worth. So there's kind of like two different senses, or there's some there's a transition going on there. That, that's yeah, you, you, that's an interesting thing you brought up there. That there's this contrast. Do we have glory or not? Well, in one sense, yes. In other sense, no. Okay. Uh, any other comments? Is that, um, go ahead. Um, Along with <clears throat> along with the glory, also the unity. You know, we we would like to be unified, but you know, we we present a, a pretty uh, shaky picture on that sometimes. <laughs> that and, is true. <laughs> and but I I read somewhere I think it was Eugene Peterson that said, you note that he's praying to the Father to keep us unified. He didn't tell the disciples to stay unified. He told them to love each other, but he, he praised the <laughs> Father to keep us unified. And so I wonder if I wonder if what we're seeing is is a kind of unity, uh, you know, that we're worshiping God, we're worshiping Jesus, but we don't all understand things the same way, and we don't have the same perspective, you know, we're not from the same cultures. We don't all we don't all understand it the same way and and maybe well we've always talked about the difference between unity and uniformity it's not the same thing and, and but but i wonder about this you know the if he prays to the father to make us unified you'd think the father could could do that at least to his own satisfaction and maybe we just don't understand it right i, I wonder that's all. Yeah, that, it's people Isn't have, it? yeah, people have used that idea that, that they that we should be one. Uh, they have tried to use that for institutional unity, of merger of churches, and get some kind of. Uh, you know, we're getting some feedback uh, somewhere. Um, Sorry, it's me. Oh, <laughs> is it the glory? The glory that we are together as one under God and in, in Christ, and that gives the glory because we are one with our father and our brother. Does that would that be the same glory? That that is yeah. That there's a connection there. I, yeah, I, I think it's in that there's great honor. Which I'm taking as you know, sometimes synonymous with glory. There's great honor in being one of God's people, of uh, being united with them. And yeah, that's we don't we we have trouble being one with each other, uh, but that reflects the fact that we have trouble being one with God. Uh, <laughs> If, if we were all one with God, uh, then yeah, we would have no trouble being one with each other. But it stems from the uh, the more fundamental lack of unity. But yet, yeah, here Jesus is praying that God will preserve His people uh, despite our dysfunctions, uh, even though we do not always respond the way that we should. We don't understand the way we would like to, and we understand in different ways. So, yeah, there's lots of reasons for disunity, 
but yet God has declared us one people nevertheless. And uh, as we draw closer to him, then we are better, we better see ourselves as part of that unity despite our differences. Comment? Yes. Yes, sir. So uh, if if we were to ask Jesus today and say, Jesus, uh, what did you mean when you are when you said you gave us glory? I wonder what Jesus will say, what he meant by that. You know, because when we look at our physical bodies, I mean, I don't see myself with a halo or a radio. <laughs> you, know, you know, I am just physical flesh and blood, and, and the only thing that I can be sure of is the intimacy, the relationship uh, we have with Jesus. I wonder what Jesus meant. Uh, do we get the glory because of this relationship? Is that it? Well, that, yeah, that's certainly a reason that you know, for us to be honored, to have glory, uh, to be significant. Maybe that's another term that could be used there. And but then there's also the, the the kind of invisible reality that we don't always see the full significance of who we are in God and Christ, and that who we are is more glorious than what we can see right now. So there's a kind of a mystery part of that in there. Uh, any any more ideas? <laughs> the truth is better than we know. Mike? Ah, uh, yes, Jim. Yes. Um, <clears throat> this statement here strikes me very uh, deeply that he loved us the same way as he loved Jesus. Uh, that seems to be a profound uh, truth. Oh, yeah, yeah, and down in verse 23. Uh, I hadn't read that yet, but uh, it's on the screen. I'm oh, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. I, yeah, yeah, that's, uh, he, he describes how we are one, uh, I and them and you and me. That's... Uh, Jesus and, and the Father and the Father and Jesus, that's kind of a, uh, of the Greek term is a perichoretic relationship where they're mutual indwelling and his purpose so that they may be mm -hmm. to complete unity. And he's kind of repeating his thought. He gave them glory so they can be one, so that they will be brought to complete unity. It's like the, the unity we have now is not yet complete, but we will eventually get there. Then the world will know, uh, he repeats this thought, uh, you sent me and have loved them. Uh, interesting, you know, that the world will know that the Father loved them. Uh, not just that the Father loved the world. That's in, earlier in John, John 3, 16, God loved the world. Uh, so that's, I would think, included. But yeah, that... that God loves the people even as you have loved me. Yeah, so that's what you were uh, pointing out there, that God loves us. I don't know. I, I'm hesitant to use the word just as much as because I'm not sure that love can be quantified like that. <laughs> but it's uh, with, with, with the same kind of love. Or, you know, that's uh, a real uh a love that is willing to make sacrifices on ben to benefit other people. Jesus obviously made sacrifices, but I think you know we, the Father has made sacrifices too. In that He gave up His Son, He endured seeing His Son being beaten and killed and rejected and all that. Uh, that, um, although one of the ancient time-honored uh, uh, characteristics of God is uh, is uh, lack of <laughs> lack of feeling. Uh, 
he kind of no, he de he's not, not he doesn't suffer. And the way that Greek word comes across sometimes, it sounds like he doesn't have any feelings. But I think that's that's wrong and you know contradiction of what all the scripture talks about of how God does have feelings for his people. Of course, he wants people to succeed that, that he made them. He, he made us. He wants us to succeed. He does not like being grieved. Uh, he he has that kind of uh, emotional uh, reactions. Although, you know, there's some anthropomorphism going on there where we uh, say that you know, God has some emotions like that but I think we are safe to do that in that God has inspired Scripture to include that kind of description, that God does have something, the closest thing that we have uh, to it is emotions, and that he does experience sadness and joy at the same time uh, because he's working with billions of people. Uh, but, uh, well, and he loves. He has concern for people. He uh, and is willing to sacrifice, give up something of his own conveniences in order to include us in what he's doing. He wants to live with us. And it did not come easy. And we are, yeah, we're, we're a difficult bunch. <laughs> Yes, sir. Um, it seems it's also Oops. feedback. I think. I think there are two people talking. I'm... I know. My... Okay. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? It's, uh, it's... I think I need to put it on mute. It's my wife's uh, iPhone. There it goes now. Okay. Sorry, right. sorry, sorry. It seems that verse uh, 23 also tells us that it is God's desire. The last part of verse 23, then the world will know that you sent me and have loved them even as you have loved me. It, it seems to me that that is also like a part of the gospel, the good news, that God's desire is that Jesus is sent by the Father and that people should know that God loves them. Kind of a short summary of the gospel yeah yeah it is uh that's that's what dan rogers says <laughs> the short summary of the gospel is god loves you <laughs> and yeah and, and a lot flows from that it's because god loves us that all these other things happen and it's because he loves us that we would want to respond Yeah, so a lot can, that's a, a bud that opens up into a beautiful flower. So can I say something? Yes, Bill. Uh, I think the glory that uh, Jesus Christ is saying is not only, it, it, it meant so many things, but I believe that one of the things that he, say, he might, say, he might uh, uh, want us to understand is that the glory is the knowledge that was given to the disciples and the knowledge that will be given to others who, are, who don't believe yet that there is really, a, there is a reality that there is God who loved them, who love us, and that there is a creator God and that the world will know that there is really a creator, creator God sooner or later and that this creator God is a reality and those people there are people yet who don't believe in them, in, in God, that there is a creator God. Scientists and others believe that there is no God. But the knowledge that, we, that, that came, that was given to the disciples and to those who believe is the knowledge that there is really a God who is the creator, one and only God. I think that's what he meant also. Yeah, yeah, that's that's got yeah, that's got to got to be included in that. The, the glory includes the knowledge that Jesus has given his disciples. Uh, that yeah, the words, and as it says there, that so that the world will know 
that you sent me. So that implies some understanding of who you is and and who uh, Jesus is. Yeah, it's uh, there's there's a lot that can be uh, pegged into that one term there. Thanks. Pastor Mike, I'll put my yes, in. yes, Ezra. Yeah, so also scanning the scriptures and maybe maybe one part, as you know, oh, everybody has said, everybody's right, that one part of God's glory is in uh, Exodus 33, verse 18, mm. 19, in Exodus 33, 18, uh, Moses said to the Lord, now show me your glory. Right. In Exodus 33, 19, it says, and the Lord said, I will cause all my goodness to pass in front of you, and I will proclaim my name, the Lord, in your presence. I will have mercy on whom I will have mercy, and I will have compassion on whom I will have compassion. And so maybe in that sense, uh, his goodness, his mercy, and compassion is part of his glory. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. It's, it's yeah, his his goodness is well. It's connected to his love as well. Yeah, it's why we uh, not just obey him out of fear, but we admire him and we want to please him because he's good. We we want to be with him, and are we're thankful that he wants to be with us, despite. Uh, as Peggy pointed out, yeah, we, we don't deserve it. We fall short of any good thing that he gives to us. But he get, he gives us much anyway because of his love. Okay, we, let's go to verse 24. Father, I want those you have given me to be with me where I am. Well, where is that? Uh, and to see my glory, the glory you have given me, because you loved me before the creation of the world. This latter, this last part there is a, a little kind of proof text that there was love uh, existing in the Trinity before the, the world began, uh, that there was love there, one person loving another. Uh, but what else what, what else does the verse say about that? That uh, Jesus wants us to be with him where he is. Well, he's already promised to be in us. So even here on earth, through the Holy Spirit, uh, he seems to be pointing toward the future as well here that we will be with Jesus where he is, wherever his resurrected body uh, is. And, you know, as the uh, New Testament describes that he will return to earth and that we will be with him there. And physically, uh, of course, everybody, you know, everybody on earth will then be with him. But there's a deeper significance to be with Jesus uh, I think, as he's already talked about, being one with him, of being in uh, mental unity with him as well, that we are with him in that sense. And to see his glory, to understand how good he is, uh, and the glory. <laughs> Jesus was given glory because the Father loved Jesus. There's a, a mutual uh, glorifying going on there. The Father glorifies Jesus. Jesus glorifies the Father. And he is also saying, well, he's giving that glory to us as well. But we're sharing in this divine life. Uh, Jesus doesn't give us the exact elements of that. Maybe we're not ready to know exactly how to describe that, but he's pointing to some greater relationship. That's relationship can be a kind of a vague term as well. That's uh, that we will be with 
we'll all be together. Uh, we, we'll live together. Comments? Pastor Mike. Uh, yes, Janet. A, Paul talked about us being seated in heavenly places with mm. Christ already. Now we don't understand what I don't. At least I don't understand what that is. <laughs> it, it's figurative, but th in some sense, you know, we are. If you know, in some in some sense, we must be there with Him. If he's, we're seated with Him, yeah, right, right. It's we do not yet see what the reality is, but Paul was saying. That's the reality. Um, comment, sir. Yes, sir. What I what I find also, at least inspiring for me, is the fact that Jesus says in this prayer says, "Father, I want those." I mean, it is inspiring to hear Jesus so much desiring us to be with Him. I find that really, you know, hearing that from the Lord that he desires so much that we are in his presence and the Father is very comforting. Yeah, it makes me think of the several times where he's promised, like, if you pray for anything in my name, it, it will be done. So here Jesus is praying himself. Yeah, that's his desire. So, yeah, we can be sure that it will be done. In verse 25, Jesus uses a, I don't know, this is the only place in the Bible where the, the, these two terms are connected, righteous father. Uh, at least we always assume that the father is righteous. And, of course, he's described as righteous in other places. But as a title here, this is unique, uh, being addressed to God, righteous Father. So that seems to suggest that, that this next paragraph is about righteousness in some way, although it's not uh, tightly nailed down. Though the world does not know you, I know you, and they know, uh, they apparently meaning the disciples. Uh, know that you have sent me. I have made you, literally, your name, and NIV can't make it, or the translators couldn't make any distinction between you and your name. What, what does it mean to make your name known? Uh, well, it, it's, I, I guess they, they are changing or dropping that name out of the translation because it can send the readers on a, a rabbit trail that doesn't go anywhere. The, the point is not that we have a specific name, uh, any certain pronunciation or spelling, but the point is that Jesus is making God himself known to them. So that's the way why they've translated it the way they have here. I've made you known to them. And I will continue to make you known in order that the love you have for me may be in them, that same kind of love, and that I may, myself may be in them. So Jesus, again, is that talking about living in them. Well, that's that love you have for me may be in them. So that's, yeah, that ties in with what I was saying about John 15, where Jesus talks about continue in my love. He's talking about Jesus' kind of love being in the disciples. Uh, at least it's pretty clear here in verse 26, that's what he's talking about. Jesus' kind of love being in us, that we also share in that kind of love. So this kind of concludes his prayer. He's you know, wrap, <laughs> wrapping it up. I've done this. I will continue to do this. Why? Uh, for love and that, uh, that Jesus will be in us, his disciples. Any comments?
uh, Pastor Mike, I yes, see sir. that uh, yes, uh, we go through the verses. I see that uh, he really emphasizes, you know, unity. And I think he's also defining what it's like to live within the triune God, you know, having the presence, the experiencing the glory that he experiences and experiencing the love, the ultimate agape love that we all yearn for. And I think that's the uh, that's the ultimate uh, thing that we are seeking for, you know, acceptance, uh, unconditional love, the true love by, by us, by your creator, by the, our Father God, Son, and Holy Spirit. And of course, the presence, the intimacy, and the relationship between Father, Son, and Spirit. And so uh, I see this as a, uh, like a, a description of what is life like in, with, in the Jesus Christ, Father, and, and the Holy Spirit, or life in the triune God. So in a sense, that's where we're going going to and you know that the uh the giver is also the gift we cannot separate you know all the benefits it's it's he's the gift he's the our he's our salvation our life is in him and everything else is just follows so that's it so that's our destiny in short a wonderful destiny awesome yeah. kind of a recap there yeah there there he talks about unity, and that unity is patterned, and I, I think more not just patterned, but also comes from unity of father and son. And it is described, characterized by the word love. So that's kind of the like, three main words that he's using throughout this prayer. Okay, chapter 18, the prayer is done, and this moves into another section of the Gospel of John. This one is kind of descriptive of events, and there's less theology in it, so I suspect we can go a little faster than we have been. As, and some of this will be overlapping with what we know from Matthew, Mark, and Luke, but Sometimes it's not just overlap, but John is filling in gaps, and he will let Matthew, Mark, and Luke they you know tell us some things he didn't. So if they tell us that he doesn't bother to, uh, he will intentionally cover a few other things. So verse uh, chapter eighteen, verse one. Uh, when he had finished praying, Jesus left with his disciples and crossed the Kidron Valley. So this was he had been making this prayer west of the Kidron Valley in the city of Jerusalem, perhaps while he was walking from the room where the Last Supper was held. Uh, we're not, not sure whether it's uh, whether he was walking or whether there was another place uh, on the way that he was able to stop at and uh, make this prayer. Either way, he John is telling us he's moving on, he's going into uh, something else. On the other side of the Kidron Valley was a garden, and he and his disciples went into it. And we know it as Gethsemane, an olive grove. Uh, Gethsemane means a, uh, refers to a olive press. And at least the, the site that is now presented as Gethsemane has a bunch of very old olive trees. And that's, uh, so that would be a suitable place for Jesus to go. And he had apparently kind of frequented that place. So Judas knew how to, uh, you know, knew where Jesus, where to find Jesus. When he, uh, after Jesus had left, he knew where Jesus would go. Presumably he had kind of traveled this route uh, before, maybe in previous years, it's that Passover time or other festivals. Judas, who betrayed him, knew the place because Jesus had often met there with his disciples. So Judas came to the garden guiding a detachment of soldiers, uh, apparently Roman soldiers, and some officials from the chief priests and the Pharisees. 
Uh, those would be the Jewish temple police. They were carrying torches, lanterns, and weapons. Jesus, knowing all that was going to happen to him, went out and asked them. He takes the initiative. <laughs> who is it you want? Well, of course, Jesus knows exactly who they, who they want. <laughs> but he, he is, he's taking command of the situation. So they say, Jesus of Nazareth, they replied. Well, I am he, Jesus said, or in Greek, ego emi, I am. Uh, Judas the traitor was standing there with him. Uh, well, of course, he'd been. When Jesus said, I am, they drew back and fell to the ground. A Quite a remarkable reaction for simply a... Uh, Somebody identifying themselves says, I think they, police come out to arrest somebody and the guy stands forward and says, yeah, I'm, yeah, I'm the one you want. The police don't normally draw back and fall to the ground. They are not that surprised. But John is describing this here as kind of this is the way people react to the divine name. I am. So he's. Again, he's not saying that this is what Jesus, and that Jesus was using the divine name, but he's kind of make a, giving a suggestion there. That th there's something unusual going on here with the soldiers' reaction. They drew back and fell to the ground. Well, I guess they get up uh, quickly enough. But, and again, Jesus asked them, who is it you want? Uh, Jesus, Jesus is the one in charge here. <laughs> Jesus of Nazareth, they said. Jesus answered, I told you that I am he. If you're looking for me, then let these men go. He gives commands to the soldiers. This happened so that the words he had spoken would be fulfilled. I have not lost one of those you gave me. Here, this is referring to physical losing. He hasn't lo he's not losing any of them to uh, arrest and crucifixion. They, they all were able to escape uh, at this time. Well, not so fast. <laughs> Simon Peter <laughs> had, had a different idea. Uh, so he had a sword. Why he had a sword? Well, we're not quite so sure. Uh, but he had it uh, earlier in one of the Gospels, Jesus had talked about, uh, you know, there's time, the time is coming when people will have swords. And Peter says, well, hey, we have two swords. Uh, apparently, Peter was the one carrying uh, carrying one of them. I was like, that's not very much, to, you know, if you're thinking of uh, instituting a rebellion against Rome, <laughs> two swords is, is just enough to get you in trouble. <laughs> But Simon Peter, yeah, okay, he, he was bold. He got himself in trouble here. He had a sword, drew it, and struck the high priest's servant, cutting off his right ear. Uh, the servant's name was Malchus, which does not play any further role in the story, but it's the mark of the, an eyewitness was there. He, he, he knows these people. He's, he's been talking about them. So this uh, the beloved disciple who wrote this gospel knew the servant's name, and probably knew the servant, not just his name, uh, Malchus. Jesus commanded Peter, put your sword away. Uh, should I not drink the cup the Father has given me? This word cup reminds us of the prayer that Jesus had in the Garden of Gethsemane, as reported in Matthew, Mark, and Luke, where Jesus talks about you know, I, that he would drink the cup, uh, a cup of suffering. John seems to assume that his readers kind of know that reference. The cup. Should I not drink the cup the Father has given me? Is it, whether it's a just a general figure of speech for some trial to come, or whether it's a specific allusion to Jesus' prayer in Gethsemane. You can't really prove it one way or another. So then the detachment of soldiers with its commander and the Jewish officials arrested Jesus. 
They bound him and brought him first to Annas, who was the father-in-law of Caiaphas, the high priest that year. And John reminds us that Caiaphas was the one who had advised the Jewish leaders that it would be good if one man died for the people. So they were kind of like this high priest family. Uh, the Romans would kind of took charge over who was high priest, and they would say, well, you know, so they were just, somebody displeased them, uh, or maybe didn't pay them enough money, who knows, they would depose and say, well, you can't be high priest anymore. The Romans had the uh, special high priest robes under lock and key so that the high priest couldn't use them on the Day of Atonement unless the Romans allowed them to. So the Romans had some power over the high priests, and so they could appoint, you know, okay, who's going to be high priest this year? Sometimes if that person was uh, you know, and comp compliant with what Rome wanted, that person could stay as high priest for many years. Otherwise, they might say, no, not you. Um, how about your brother? Uh, maybe your brother will be more uh, cooperative with us. So here, Annas and Caiaphas were the same family. One who says one was the father-in-law of the other. Uh, Annas had been high priest this year. It's Caiaphas. Well, John does not tell us what happened in front of Caiaphas. Matthew, Mark, and Luke tell us about a trial in front of Caiaphas and where and what Jesus said there and what Caiaphas said, but uh, John does not tell us any of that. He switches the scene to Peter's denial. And the other the other gospels tell us this too. John tells us a few additional details. <clears throat> Simon Peter and another disciple. Doesn't say who it was. We're following Jesus because this disciple was known to the high priest. He went with Jesus into the high priest's courtyard. So the, here was this disciple of Jesus, uh, apparently on good terms uh, with the high priest. The Whoever was gatekeeper of the courtyard uh, recognized him and let him in. Says, oh, oh, yeah, it's you. Come on in. Who is this disciple? Well, some say it's John himself uh, as the manager of a fishing business. He may have had uh, official business with a high priest. Uh, that seems unlikely to me, but uh, I suppose that's possible. It seems like they would have had other you know, middlemen do it because they lived in very different geographic areas. But it, anyways, there's just some disciple, uh, maybe one of the ones who lived in Judea. Well, anyway, known to the high priest. Verse 16, Peter had to wait outside the door. They didn't recognize him. The other disciple who was known to the high priest, he came back, spoke to the servant girl on duty there, and brought Peter in. So he was well enough known by the servant girl knew him well enough and accepted his uh, instructions to let this guy in. Uh, so that's kind of a, a mysterious disciple uh, going on there. And they're, they're watching to see what happens. Simon Peter, well, yes, he was bold at first and he later denied Jesus, but he did have the courage to want to see what's going on. <laughs> Verse 17, she asked him, you aren't one of this man's disciples too, are you? That's an interesting little word there, too. She, it's as if she already knew that that first guy was one of Jesus' disciples. And she says, you aren't one of the disciples too, are you? So it seems to have been known that this other disciple was a disciple of Jesus. And 
that did not uh, was not reason to exclude him from the courtyard. He was not uh, in trouble of being arrested as well. So it's kind of a mysterious passage there. Uh, as you you aren't one of those disciples too. So Peter replied, "I am not." Any comments on this mysterious other disciple? Judas? Hmm. That's an interesting idea. Hmm. They would have known him if he was negotiating before he betrayed Jesus. Well, that's but true. He was, that's, didn't yeah. he have dealings with them, though? Because he dealt with the money. Right. Yeah. As to why Judas would do want Peter in there, I don't know. Who knows? Well, well but he'd bring out the sword again and start the war. <laughs> uh, well, yeah, that's an interesting idea. Hmm. Definitely not Matthew. <laughs> Matthew, the tax collector. Well. <laughs> hmm. Yeah. Oh, well. And the last denial, verse 18. It was cold, and the servants and officials stood around a fire they had made to keep warm. Peter was also standing with them, warming himself. And it's like, well, he's cold. Uh, it's interesting. It mentioned that fire because uh, that, and it's NIV translation doesn't bring it out here, but they talk about it as a charcoal fire. And the word charcoal is used only twice in the New Testament. Once here for this fire where Peter was keeping warm. And once again, after the resurrection, when Jesus made a small fire to cook fish and asked, Je and asked Peter, do you love me? And that repeated the word charcoal kind of in, in Greek would help tie those two incidents together. That one is a kind of a response or counterbalance to the other. Jesus or Peter denies Jesus three times then Peter reaffirms his love for Jesus three times and Jesus uh, yeah, accepts him, uh, appoints him to leadership in the church. Well, meanwhile, <laughs> the high priest questioned Jesus about his disciples and his teaching. And that's, we can uh, pick that up next week because we're about out of time now. Any comments, questions? Just thank you. <laughs> <laughs> First thank time, you. I mean, that I like that uh, connection. Never heard of it before, that the charcoal connects those incidents of denial and, and then confirming love. That's interesting. Thank you. Yeah. All right. Well, let's turn the uh, recording off. Stop to share and turn recording off.